up everyone? Welcome to my Bitcoin story. It's been a long time since we have, you know, another video, but today I'm very excited for this video. We're going to introduce Alessandro. He's from Venezuela and also work for Ledin. So we are going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, Ledin and then the mortgage backed Bitcoin. Uh, but before that, uh, you know, we everyone currently talking about hyperinflation and then venezuela is one of the countries that uh, just recently you know uh, experienced hyperinflation so i want to invite alessandro here to share his experience his story about what was what's happening in venezuela actually so welcome to the show alessandro Oh, thank you for having me, Dia. It's, it's a pleasure. It took us, it took us a little, uh, longer than expected, but finally we're here. So pretty much looking forward to it. All good. All good. So yeah, Alessandro, so you are, you are a Venezuelan now living in Brazil. Yeah. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. So um, I think a lot of audience really, you know, want to understand what's what's happening, you know, when, when during hyperinflation, we see that right now Turkey is... Uh, Turkey inflation is going, you know, really high, and even like in the U.S., people are afraid about inflation. So uh, maybe before we go to the inflation part, just tell us a little bit about uh, your childhood. Like, how was it? How was it? You know, when you were um, when you were a kid, like how was the the situation, and then up until you know the hyperinflation part. Yeah, for sure. So look, um, I guess that since I'm 28 years old, right? So I was mm -hmm. born in 93. Um, I'm, I'm this one, I'm, I'm, I'm from the millennial generation, right? So, um, but regarding Venezuela specifically, every, every year of my life, I've seen the economy just go bust, right? Like always always a contraction, never an expansion, right? <laughs> it's this very long-term painful process, right? To put it mm -hmm. in a few words. But look, I guess that inflation started getting, getting rampant, right? And, and just crazy in, in Venezuela and when I was already... Yeah, so in these countries where you have, you know, very high inflation levels, mm -hmm. I you will see the government doing monetary redenominations, right? Mm -hmm. Like the um, POSs cannot support any longer so high amounts, right, mm -hmm. of transactions. The infrastructure was just not built to support so, so high, uh, so numbers so high, right? And so it's, it, it's as inflation starts getting bad on, on to worse and to catastrophic, which is like, again, um, a very good example, as in the case of Venezuela, you see the government being forced, not because they want to, want to right? It, it, they're just, they just push it to the level where they are forced to eventually re-denominate the currency. And, and that just makes it worse, right? Mm -hmm. So I've seen in my life already four monetary re-denominations of the, the Venezuelan Bolivar, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the Bolivar is this weird, to call it in a friendly way, shit coin, right? <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> it's the first shit coin that I ever experienced happening <laughs> in my life. And so, you know, uh, bad currencies can sometimes experience this very volatile situations mm -hmm. like we're, we're seeing right now in Turkey, right? Like the Turkish leader has already, to your point, mm -hmm. lost almost 30% of its value just in the last month. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to that, right? As a Venezuela, I'm used to even, even more catastrophic uh, vol volatility memories where I would lose 30% of my savings overnight. But how, how yeah. was the feeling? Like, you know, uh, like, um, I mean, I, I assume you feel like, oh, shit, like I have to um, spend this money as fast as I can. Exactly. Or what, what was the feeling at that time? Exactly. So at a personal level, I guess, and at a psychological level, what starts happening to you, it's that you start having this very short time preference, right? Mm -hmm. This 
this whereby um, as time goes by, everything needs to happen faster to you, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, as as your main source of income starts losing, start like it doesn't make sense anymore to you if it if it's only only in the currency that's depreciating at a faster pace that the work you're being able to 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 you know to to support yourself and then it's it's you start wanting to spend whatever it is that you have Mm -hmm. or ultimately if you if you want to save you would try to go for another store of value right because Mm -hmm. essentially your your currency already lost its store of value property right Mm -hmm. so so you start looking at other other Venezuela started looking at other currencies, for example, that it's mainly the dollar, right? Mm-hmm. Right now, the Venezuelan economy is pretty much dollarized after all of this inflation and hyperinflation period where the currency is, was just wiped out, right? And it's, mm-hmm. it's been a thing that's been happening since the 1970s, right? Mm-hmm. So it had already been happening 20 years before I was born. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So mm-hmm. I experienced the whole decay of the volleyball until it went into 50 plus years right of history mm. of, of 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 currency depreciation but then at a, at a society level there would what you get to see what i get what i got to see in venezuela is um people just people start losing trust because mm-hmm. essentially money is just an a formal and efficient way of agreeing right between w- between parties that want to transact w- with each other so yeah. when you lose when you lose the means of exchange the ma- the main means of exchange that an economy had been using and at the same time you had bad bad government and and regulatory policies right that make it even harder for people to use alternatives so ultimately you're being coerced to use your currency even though you don't want to use it sometimes mm-hmm. because some 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 goods and services you can still buy them just using the bolivar so what okay. i saw was th- this whole process of economically speaking right and um of how how people merchants companies even the government itself started bit by bit uh quitting using the bolivar you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Un- until eventually you were just, everybody's just forced today, had had been forced today to just to just use a different currency. form of, of, exactly, a different mm-hmm. form of currency. And that's why at some point Bitcoin gets in the middle of the story, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that's very interesting. Um, uh, then people are opting out from Bolivar because, uh, you know, Bolivar is worthless. And when did you start knowing about Bitcoin? Like, how how was your introduction to Bitcoin? Yeah. So look, the first time that I got to find about got to find about Bitcoin was in 2011. Again, I was in high school. I was so I was uh, just browsing in the internet with some friends mm-hmm. at a friend's apartment, and I was so young. I you know, I was just not able to see the long-term value, store of value, you know, pristine monetary asset of, of the humanity's history. But um, but it was eventually in 2012 when I really started diving and investigating more about Bitcoin. Pretty much at that time, it was mostly about, you know, mining. You could still mine with G- GPUs. ASICs were not around at the time, like ant miners. They started getting around in like in 2013. And then um, from there, my Bitcoin story just gets just gets crazy. I mean, I, I in 2013, I co-founded the biggest Bitcoin mining farm of Venezuela with my best friend from high school. And um, that was that was a lifetime experience, right? Um, at that time, the government was the Venezuelan government was not aware of this still. Mm-hmm. Like it was, it was this very underrated stuff, underground stuff. You were just an uh, an idiotic, crazy nerd that was just playing and fooling around with a magical coin over the internet or whatever, right? 
So there was no seizure of mining equipment, no government regulation for Bitcoin whatsoever. Um, the first, the first peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces of globally, I mean, but but where you started seeing volume picking up in Latin America was in Venezuela. Mm, we okay. were we were one of the first market makers in local Bitcoins, Venezuela, with their mining operations. Okay. So, so I guess that this is to say that I was, I was one of those dudes that at a very early age, I was able to find Bitcoin as an alternative, but it was partly due to the regulations that the government had in place mm -hmm. regarding contra, contra currency exchanges. Mm -hmm. Right. So whenever you wanted to essentially, let's say you have your family, right. And you want to travel with your family to the U S mm -hmm. you want your, your children to meet Mick, Mickey for the first time and go to Disney or whatever. Right. Yeah. So if you had believe it is in Venezuela, you couldn't, you couldn't legally go to the bank and exchange him for dollars. That mm -hmm. was illegal in Venezuela. Okay. So it's just you had to go to the informal or what people or what people like calling the black market, right? Yeah. And buy and buy dollars on the street from somebody that you already trust or that you knew, whatever, with whom you've already had this, uh, you've already done this kind of operations, right? Of of, of trade. And so um that that's why you see in Venezuela since since the 80s this whole market like informal industry right of people um people providing uh, uh informal remittances and exchange services right essentially like a peer-to-peer -peer kind um, of thing exactly <laughs> exactly a peer-to-peer -peer kind of thing until 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 bitcoin and cryptocurrencies stable coins right in this case started coming into the story and so in the case of you being in Venezuela, what a peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency marketplace means to you, it's just a more automated experience of what you have to live for the past 20, 30, 40 <laughs> years of your life. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. So, so, so that's why, I mean, um, I, was, I was going in 2012 to study English in the U.S., Okay. So Bitcoin was was already this very interested or interesting alternative for grabbing bolivares from Venezuela and then exchanging them for Bitcoin to it eventually exchanging for like you know US dollar cash yeah. in the US. So so your main main idea was that when you see the mining opportunity, you see it as like this is a way for me to uh, in the beginning to get more money and then store it in dollar in the beginning. Exactly. It was essentially a more streamlined and digital way, right? Mm -hmm. Of and, and and let's call it as, as well sovereign sovereign way as well, right? Of accessing dollars. That that's what my friend and I. That, well, that's what we saw because essentially we had to pitch about the idea to some investors. They were from the uh, banking industry in Venezuela, and to them it was all about. I can get bolivares or dollars in your bank account in an hour using this mm -hmm. magical internet site and my <laughs> magical currency that I'm telling you about. But essentially the whole, you know, importance of, of for a Venezuelan was that you could access dollars faster, cheaper. Okay. And then uh, when did, was it for you, uh, when, when was it click that, it is actually more valuable than dollar that bitcoin is more valuable than dollar yeah so i i would say that that's that i i know i noticed that the moment that i really started digging more at like st studying more about bitcoin at a technological level to mm -hmm. understand it as a money that it's protocol right that is completely unbeatable by any government that it it was already becoming this massive secure network after the honestly the ASIC miners boom mm -hmm. honestly because we saw the whole 
ASIC miner trend start all the way from N minor S ones in China and the ones that were starting being built in the US at the time, S threes came in the middle and S five, and it was so explosive how you saw how I experienced all of the people that I knew in Minnesota that were mining with GPUs, all of a sudden were starting to mine with ant miners. Everybody was talking about this. It was more and more and more everybody from the circles that I knew, right? At mm-hmm. that time, that's the thing. So I, I guess that by 2015, I understood that this was already bigger than most thought, right? Mm-hmm. Especially because when you went into reddit forums and when you went into twitter at those times you didn't see so much of the conversation of bitcoin around venezuela Mm -hmm. so it was so i felt that i was experiencing this own bitcoin lens of the whole story right of of the whole deal like i thought at it since 2015 i really understood that because of of government censorship in Venezuela, mm-hmm. right? Because of the socialist trend, Venezuela not be like bit by bit ripping itself apart from the global economy, but mm-hmm. Bitcoin still being this thing through which you could still operate at a global scale, honestly, without taking a plane, having a family member in the US to open a US bank account in dollars, Go to go through customer, you know, through customer service every time that they block your account just because you're Venezuelan. If you don't have an EU passport or another citizenship, whatever, whatever, whatever. So I saw it as this very the currency of digital nomads and hackers at the time. And I was like, this shit is unbeatable. Mm-hmm. Nobody's gonna, nobody's, nobody's gonna beat these people. There's a lot of people from the traditional banking industry that still don't know about this. I I can I know it from firsthand because I had some some investors from the banking industry in Venezuela and the first project that I co-founded and I was like this is this is to what I have to dedicate the rest of my life to mm-hmm. honestly and since then bitcoin has been this unique and scarce shield that has protected me and my family for the past almost 11 years and it's not going to stop right wow. and it's yeah yeah and and how uh when you say your family or is it like include your your mom and dad and and sisters brothers who everyone's like in you know having e- bitcoin ev- everybody i mean like since i orange build myself my mission was to dedicate myself to first orange billing my family mm-hmm. like we we were one of those families that was affected by the OH crisis in the US. Yeah. My father was this architect in Venezuela that just had some of his savings in the US, just like many okay. people, right? Like you want to have this st- sort of stable, right? Mm-hmm. If, if we were to call it stable, which we understand Bitcoiners that it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why your mission is to orange bill your pops, right? So, yeah. But but and and anyway, we just went. We just traveled back in in '09 to the U.S. to check her bank account. Me and mm-hmm. my pops, and we noticed that it was all of our funds, all of our remaining savings, were withdrawn from the account. Wow! So that that was for multiple reasons, right? Okay. But um, to keep it short, that was like a crack moment in my life, in which I, because of which I started asking myself. What is a bank? What is money? What do banks do? Why does that? Ha- why does this happen? You know, to my family savings, mm-hmm. and how the hell can I help my my family to recover this? Yeah. Right, and uh, and I think there's to me there's still only one underpriced option and alternative out there, and it's. Uh, and I think it'll continue being the same for the for the next decades. We are we're a Bitcoin family, and we're it's it's impossible to take us back mm-hmm. into the traditional system because of so many things that we have to go through with banks 
because of the Venezuelan crisis and the U.S. crisis combined at the same time, right? So, so it's like a double blow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so there you go. It's like it's for in, in our case, it's never ending reasons for Bitcoining ourselves, honestly. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's that's in a in a big way part of my Bitcoin story. Like that's how that's how I discovered Bitcoin, and that's been mainly um, my my mission with Bitcoin coming from Venezuela was honestly just trying to protect your family and your family's wealth in the midst of Venezuela. Look, yeah, Venezuela is in modern history, the most catastrophic uh, economic depression of Latin America. Yeah. Right. And it's been so far as well, the most prolonged hyperinflationary period of economic history in that time as well. Mm-hmm. So is this it is this weird event, you know, that can happen to to any nation in in a century in a century's time, right? And we've seen this happen before to Germany, right? The Weimar Republic. We've seen this happen before to Brazil. We've mm-hmm. seen this happen so many times before, and it's all and it, it all goes back to centralized policies and bad monetary and administrative policies coming from the regulators. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how do you see, uh, I mean, your family is, you know, lucky, I guess, because you in you got exposed to Bitcoin, you do Bitcoin mining. Uh, but what about the average people before and mm-hmm. not right now? Like, how, how are they uh, see Bitcoin? Like, how is the Bitcoin adoption in Venezuela? So I guess that Bitcoin started going more mainstream in Venezuela since 2017, um, not only because of, uh, you know, the second halving cycle, uh, Bitcoin started to boom ab- above the thousands. It was, the, it was that third massive bull run that Bitcoin was already experiencing in 2017, right? Mm-hmm. But more than that, it was Donald Trump becoming U.S. the president in the U.S. and the U.S. sanctioning the Venezuelan regime, right? Yeah. So when the U.S. sanctions another government, essentially that government is unable to move dollars in the global banking system. If you're not friends with the U.S., the EU follows. So the EU sanctions you, so you can't move the euro. <laughs> Wow. Right. So you're only so you're only left with a handful of, you know, other bad currencies like the yuan or the ruble or, or whatever that nobody uses for global trade. Yeah. And so essentially you need a way to continue making international trade and international payments that are non censorable. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 there's like if you look outside of the petrodollar and and the banking system that we that we've globally built since the 70s since the gold standard drop there's there's no other infra open infrastructure through which through which you can go to access non-censorable payments right so that's why in 2017 the venezuelan government started started to regulate cryptocurrencies in venezuela Mm -hmm. trying in a way trying to own more of the share right yeah. of that market and ecosystem that was already being built in Venezuela and um they started trying to create their own cryptocurrency and, right yeah. the El, the yeah. El Petro cryptocurrency yeah yeah and that's why the Venezuelans started doing this huge free marketing campaign for bitcoin uh-huh. right like when trying to promote whichever digital asset or cryptocurrency that you're building, whatever, right? Whatever we want to call it. Alternative version of Bitcoin or derivative version of Bitcoin, right? And how I like to call them. You always have to resort at some point to talk about Bitcoin. Yeah. Because 
it's it's a, it's a marketing like you know it's a, you have to fall you have to point to bitcoin that's true yeah you know it's mother Th- teresa Calcuta. how how you how mexicans <laughs> would call it of cryptocurrencies you know what i mean like yeah, yeah it's there you can't avoid it like whenever whenever people google it they will top themselves in the bitcoin they just need a this was just another reason for people to Google more and find out more about Bitcoin, right? So, so what has happened since 2017 in Minnesota specifically, right? Is that you do see this more broad, I would say broad awareness of Bitcoin. Like if you go on the street and you talk to a 20 years old, 30 years old person, there is a, from the capital city at least, there is a, I would say more than 80% or 70% chance that this person will know the word Bitcoin and will know what it is. Like you see ads on the highway in Venezuela right now about Bitcoin and you mm. start, and cryptocurrencies. And that started being a thing since 2017 because it became a regulated industry. It yeah. became a regulated and per- permitted market in Venezuela, sort of speak, right? So... To give you, to put into perspective what I'm saying in numbers, right? Right now, there's this very, there's a private firm in Venezuela that does, they, they, they grab market data from different merchants in different cities. The main cities, the main cities where commerce is happening right now in Venezuela. It's, uh, it's the survey that they do of around 2,000 different merchants. And so what they do is just ask them what are the different payment methods that they are using and supporting, right? When selling their goods or services. Yeah. yeah. And so this firm is bought, bought by, for example, the IMF. They yeah. support them. They fund them. They give them some funding so that they can support themselves. And, and this way, globally, data from the Venezuelan economy is more accessible. So yeah. that international parties, the World Bank, the IMF, they are able, they are able of assessing by themselves what is the current economic situation in the country, right? Yeah. Because data, public data from the government is just crap. It's controlled, you know what I mean? Manipulated, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> manipulated goes through the government filters. So it's you can't you can't use their data to know the actual state of the economy itself, right? So yeah. Right now, Econalitica reported in their last, uh, their last survey that over 1.9% of all payments made to merchants mm-hmm. in Venezuela, and it's an approximate number, right, using their models, but it is like the most trustworthy data that we, that we currently have to assess what is the current status of the Venezuelan economy, right, yeah. and how, how it's being... How, how it's being digested, so to speak, right? Yeah. So 1.9% of all payments have are being made to merchants in cryptocurrencies. Mm-hmm. Now, most of that is not Bitcoin because of, of the volatility discussion, taking, you know, 10 minutes to verify if it's peer-to-peer directly through the blockchain, taking more than that if you have the Bitcoin deposit in an exchange, whatever, right? Like, and if yeah. you have them in cold storage, then how the hell that you pay at a merchant when you have your, right? Yeah. So, so it's mostly stable coins, right? USDT mm-hmm. is the king of sta- stable coins in Venezuela and Latin America. And okay. that's because of Binance. That's because of Binance. Because the fashion through which cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin mostly are, uh, are being transacted in Latin America is through peer-to-peer markets marketplaces mm. so, so like local bitcoin paxful that kind of exactly yeah. local bitcoin paxful binance right now binance for example has 40 percent of the cryptocurrency yearly volume in brazil mm-hmm. and it's mainly because of the peer-to-peer marketplace mm-hmm. and so what people what people would mostly do instead of just paying directly in cryptocurrencies if the other party does not su- still support cryptocurrency payments, right? If he doesn't accept Bitcoin or, or, or any stable coin, you would just exchange your digital assets on a peer-to-peer market and then 
grab the local currency and make payment, make a payment mm. with your debit card, so to speak, right? Um, yeah. Normal people right now mm-hmm. still want dollars in Venezuela. Mm-hmm. So that's why stable coins are becoming so popular because Venezuela is one of these other Latin American countries that is just going through the normal process of, okay, our local currency is is worthless. Mm -hmm. What's the other most used tradable currency that we can use, which which is the dollar in the case of Latin America and, and most of emerging markets, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then from there, you have this more already, you know, hyper dollarized person whereby that person would already have part of his wealth or savings in Bitcoin. And if needed, would sell part of his assets, his, his cryptocurrencies to, to make a payment, whatever, right? But okay. ultimately, for people that have already discovered Bitcoin in Venezuela, mo- for most of them, for most of them, it's already the last resource of your savings mm-hmm. that you would ex- that you would use for daily expenses. Mm-hmm. So the other thing to take into consideration is that in the case of Latin America, historically, most of our economies have been tied to agriculture, right? So the banking system in the 40s and the 50s uh, and the credit and the credit boom and expansion of that period in 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 the continent that allowed for you know sort of sort of speak a rebirth of the region after second world war was mainly due to again agriculture so we don't have very developed financial markets mm-hmm. you know we're we're not the us we're not we're not this market venezuela's not this market where a lot of people would have would have invested in the Venezuelan stock exchange, exchange yeah. right? And the Venezuelan stock markets. So, yeah, yeah. It, so if you wanted to invest and protect your savings with, with, with anything other than Bitcoin and digital assets in the past, you could only just buy a car, buy a house, buy goods. And ultimately that's, that's not liquid enough, right? For when you have to sell a part of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And the entry level barrier for those things is higher than than Bitcoin because you can divide it into, you know, 100 million units. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so here the entry what I'm trying to say here is that the entry level barrier, specifically in Venezuela and then the whole region in Latin America to access financial services, buying shares, bonds, buying us stock whatever is so high Mm -hmm. that (laughs) it was almost impossible for the normal venezuelan person to access a way to protect his wealth yeah that's it and so that's why bitcoin is the ultimate lifesaver in the case of countries like venezuela yeah 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 and and i think this is also uh interesting because right now people see bitcoin as as a store of value uh during this whole volatility of all of the other currencies out there uh because we also see that dollar is being printed uh how many trillions <laughs> since 2020 um so i think we can go into your companies right now with i think it's very interesting because a lot of people don't want to sell their bitcoin because they see that this is something very precious to them for their wealth and uh you know store it as a as an asset uh yeah can you tell me more about leaden and how this uh, bitcoin back loans work oh yeah for sure so uh look at at leaden we uh, we like to see i, I was taught by one of leaden's co-founders right that you can do three things with bitcoin you can you can keep it you can trade it or you can borrow against it, right? What Letting is trying to basically do is offer all of those three things, but essentially it started again. It started with um, offering people the possibility of borrowing dollars against their Bitcoin, right? Uh, Letting was the first company to issue uh, a Bitcoin-backed loan in Canada, right? So we're can 
we're the first Canadian lending company of the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's funny because look, one of uh, one of Lennon's co-founder, he is Venezuelan just like me. He just left the country mm. like, I don't know, more than 20 years ago, right? He went yeah. to Canada, but he's 10 years older than me. And because of that, he was able to bank on, on the opportunity of this, this very broad and um, broad, broadly known trade that was being done in Venezuela at the time because of country currency exchange rates, right? Mm-hmm. So because of what we were talking about, you could essentially, if you had access to getting preferential dollars, right, from the government in Venezuela, because you had a business and you wanted to import goods into the country, you needed to make an international payment in some form of global currency, right? Like, yeah. right? Not the Bolivar. Like, <laughs> if you wanted to buy, if you, you wanted to buy, for example, cars from a U.S. car dealer and take those cars to Venezuela, you couldn't yeah. pay the U.S. Yeah. car dealer. And believe it is so. And the and the Venezuelan banking system was got completely disconnected, right? Mm-hmm. And disconnected from the global banking system so there was no way of making a wire transfer right yeah from bolivares into the global banking system yeah no way so essentially you had to ask for permission to the government and of say like file a report and say look i, I want to buy this x amount of goods mm-hmm. right or i have to pay for the services with my company uh uh uh, outside of the country and they need this much amount of dollars. They would evaluate your case and if approved, you would get to buy dollars from the Venezuelan government or some private banks in the country that were allowed by the government to pass on dollars at a preferential rate to people in the country. So Mariso y Bartolomeo, Lenin's co-founder, he was one of the people that started tra- doing this amazing trade of getting access to preferential rates of dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Legally doing so with, with his family business and then being able to grab those same dollars and exchange them with his friends that had other businesses, right? Mm-hmm. But at the informal and real rate at which the ex- the dollar was being exchanged against the Bolivar, right? Yeah. So it's, sometimes it would go so crazy as to, you know, like 10x return oh. on your investment, 5x oh. return on your investment in a week, wow. in a month. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> a- annualize, annualize, you would outperform any other stock market an investment, whatever you want to call, whatever you want to call it, right? Like yeah, so yeah, yeah. even even Bitcoin after Bitcoin came came into the scene. So whenever that started happening, right, and inflation started ticking up there, if you borrowed, right, against any asset that you had in Venezuela in Bolivares, and then you use those Bolivares to yeah. buy dollars, to then wait for the Bolivar to depreciate. And yeah. gradually pay back your loan in Bolivares, you would essentially keep free dollars. You would get access to free dollars if you had, if you were financially savvy enough mm-hmm. to understand the trade and mm-hmm. bank that opportunity just by exchanging two different currencies, right? So to put it into perspective, that's like that's essentially what Michael Saylor is doing right now mm-hmm. in the US. Right. Like right now, finally, we're seeing in the U.S. inflation at 40 years highs, decade highs. But rates are so low that if you if you borrow against whatever it is that you have in the U.S. and you have access to those artificial rates, right, you and you essentially invest that into an asset like Bitcoin that is you know, yeah, that is giving you a yearly yeah. return of around 170 percent or whatever, you're essentially getting free Bitcoin. So it's the same. So that's why Mauricio y Bartolomeo envisioned that the same thing would happen. The same thing that happened to the volleyball in Venezuela would eventually happen in North America and most of the world. Yeah. Because it was just fiat currency yeah. in the end but yeah. at another level, right? Yeah. So yeah. 
So that's why he envisioned building Bitcoin-backed loans in North America against um, against the U.S. dollar. Mm-hmm. And right now, and right now, that's becoming so popular that since letting launch three years ago, its first Bitcoin-backed loan. Now we were even getting into Bitcoin mortgages as well, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so there is definitely institutional demand and even retail demand for these products because Bitcoin being this pristine, we, we like to call it pristine collateral, right? Mm-hmm. Because you don't have to go through credit score checks with Bitcoin, just like with a house or with a business, evaluate the cash flow, credit scores, all of that, right? Yeah. Bitcoin allows any lending company that wants to offer crypto or Bitcoin backed services to essentially offer loans and give liquidity cash to people in just three clicks without doing any back credit score checks or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I guess, I guess that's really, that's, that's pretty much uh, an interesting story for, for how one of one of Lenin's co-founders coming from Venezuela, just like me, envisioned building the company, right? So, but I guess I guess that sorry for for getting myself into the podium here. I <laughs> guess you have other questions for regarding no, no, Len, no, no. And Letting and her services, right? <laughs> I think I think it's very interesting. And uh, one of the things that I I want to also like still trying to grasp what happened. Uh, you what you're saying is like that's when bitcoin value goes up but when when the bearish market you know bitcoin values goes down and how how the 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 loan works <laughs> yes so that is a great question this yeah. is definitely a product that requires some risk management without a doubt like that's yeah. why at Lennon we have in place our own risk management team uh, we don't rehypo- rehypothecate people's bitcoin so, so what essentially happens is, let's say that a, you took out Bitcoin at sixty thousand dollars in a theoretical, in a theoretical scenario, then Bitcoin drops on average around thirty percent, so like eighteen thousand dollars from from the level that you bought your Bitcoin. You would essentially get a notification on our system that will prompt you into topping up your loan, so require you require you to just to deposit more collateral okay. onto your loan. So you can do that either with Bitcoin, with a wire transfer or with USDC. Mm-hmm. So to your point, it is definitely a product that is that does not fit everybody's needs in the Bitcoin space, but there is definitely this uh, thing technophile sort of people and uh, early Bitcoin adopters and also institutions, for example, from North America, whereby, you know, in the US, if you saw, if you buy and sell your Bitcoin, you have to pay capital gains on it. But, and that's around 30 plus percent, depending if you held the Bitcoin for more than a year or less than that, right? So Mm -hmm. if you come to us and you deposit Bitcoin and you take out a loan via wire transfer, you're essentially not, um, not creating a taxable event, right? Mm, so yeah. you would you would be paying nine point five percent a year on your loan instead of paying thirty plus percent in taxes to the government, right? Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very so a, very appealing <laughs> scheme. Yeah. Ex- exactly, <laughs> and exactly, and 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 it's and it's important to mention that this is partly why because of this kind of products, it's partly why we're seeing especially mining companies from North America, yeah. right? Being able to keep all of the Bitcoin that they're mining. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and funder operations just taking out a loan oh, against wow. their Bitcoin. Now, of course, in the case of Bitcoin mining companies, there are more sophisticated loans, which is not Lennon's case, right? But mm-hmm. there are most, more sophisticated loans whereby lenders would assess the value of the mining equipment as well and the mining infrastructure and take that as collateral as well. So mm-hmm. essentially, Bitcoin mining companies can not only nowadays borrow against their Bitcoin, they're able to borrow against their mining infrastructure as well, which is huge. 
just because it's millions and millions of dollars as well, right? So mm-hmm. I guess that it's uh, it's how I see it. It's just this beautiful process, right, of Bitcoin becoming the most recognized and wanted asset in yeah. the planet. Yeah, yeah. And if and and if that's and if that's going to continue to happen to Bitcoin. Bitcoin will just become this asset that you can use to access any kind of other financial product in the world, be it a futures contract, be it an options contract, yeah, yeah, yeah. be it a stock, be it a fund that owns Bitcoin, be it a mining company, be it a loan, be it a Bitcoin mortgage, right? Be it a yeah. Bitcoin savings account, whatever. It's going to just be everywhere and it's spreading itself throughout not only all of the internet, but all of the financial world that we've built upon. It's going to eat it. And so it's, it's just yeah, part yeah. of Bitcoin doing its own natural thing that it's supposed to do, right? It's, it's like a, a DeFi-based Bitcoin. <laughs> exact, exactly. Well, we like, we like to call ourselves um, CeFi, right? Because yeah. in the end, Letting is a regulated company regulated by U.S. regulators and, and the Canadian securities regulator as well, the OSC. So we do have to report to the regulator. But ultimately, it's, it's this, right, this transition period from centralized to completely decentralized. There's something in the middle, right? And, the, and there's still regulation. Now, uh, to your point, like, when we talk about DeFi, right? We, we're still figuring out this whole Bitcoin DeFi world, right? And even, even this normal stablecoin DeFi world or DeFi world built on top of Ethereum or Solana or whatever it may be, there's just so many pinpoints that uh, regulators can regulate, right? Yeah. So in the case of Latin, we don't engage specifically with DeFi protocols, not even with their clients' funds, because there is still this grayish area of how regulators, right, will ultimately approach these protocols, but because ultimately they are managed by some central form yeah. of group. It can right? be a security, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like to be honest, we're doing this thing, we're regulated, we have to do so many things just to comply with regulations. And so whenever we see this whole DeFi protocol is doing their own things and drinking coffee and say, we are the real decentralization. We're like, uh, no, I don't know how much <laughs> that's going to last, honestly. So we just, we just want to keep it safe and we are fairly conservative. And that's partly why we only manage ourselves with two assets, Bitcoin and USDC, because again, in Latin America, people want to access People want to access some form of dollar savings account. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, So if you give them, if you give them a USDC account next to a Bitcoin account, even if they don't know about Bitcoin, for some of them, it might be the pill they needed to swallow to eventually see Bitcoin and dive into Bitcoin easily. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? I mean, we we all see right now El Salvador is using. Bitcoin as their legal tender and everywhere people are start accepting Bitcoin. It's, I mean, they are still accepting dollars, but they're also accepting Bitcoin. How do you see the trends coming in Latin America and Venezuela with, with this situation? Look, I may be wrong. I'm an optimist in life. I can yeah. say this, right? <laughs> I'm an optimist. I am optimist that other countries will follow and mm-hmm. will make Bitcoin legal tender. Yeah. And, uh, Let me tell you why I think that. It's um, in the case of El Salvador, El Salvador is the sixth, sixth country in the world with the highest personal remittances as a percentage of their GDP, right? Okay. So currently, they get more than $6 billion dollars a year in remittances, right, to mm-hmm. the country, mostly sent from the US. Yeah. El Salvador is a 24 billion plus economy right now. So essentially, El Salvador pays more than $400 million dollars a year in fees, mm-hmm. right? To get those remittances into the country. Mm-hmm. So families are losing 
Salvadorian families are losing $400 million a year just for accessing financial services, right? Yeah. To send money back to their families, right? Like wow. right now in the holiday, on the yeah. holidays, right? Yeah. So what President Bukhari is just trying to do is say, okay, let's just try to keep this $400 million within our economy and our, our people, right? Yeah. So how do we do that? What do we have as an alternative that it's not, you know, money gram, yeah. money gram and Western Union and this, this, this gang, right? This gang of, uh, yeah. of family women's companies, right? So, <laughs> so that's, the, so making Bitcoin legal tender in a country like El Salvador, where, where a huge chunk of your GDP is, is a participation of people in the economy through remittances, right? It starts making huge sense to push for Bitcoin and the Lightning Network specifically, right? Mm -hmm. So that so that people can streamline that whole process, right, of sending money back to their families, and then being able to just being able to then fast in, in a fast manner transform that Bitcoin into dollar to pay for whatever it is that they need or just use the same Bitcoin that they receive to pay at some merchant, right? So I yeah. was in El Salvador right now uh, for LabitConf. Yeah. And I can tell you, Dea, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was weird in a very beautiful way because the moment, <laughs> you, the moment you put boots on the ground in El Salvador and you start talking to an Uber taxi driver, yeah. you can talk with him about monetary policies and wow. digital money Ugh. and he would tell you he would tell you that cash is trash you know that the trend is all digital and that he wants bitcoin and that yeah, he yeah. already has received his 30 dollars in bitcoin that are worth now 40 something dollars in bitcoin so it's crazy it's crazy because look el salvador did in a month right mm -hmm. with the chivo bitcoin wallet and making bitcoin move until there in september whatever yeah with that move, President B. Kelly was essentially able to give more than 3 million people Bitcoin in El Salvador yeah. in a week, right? So yeah. the country has more than 20 years of banking history, of dollarized, of dollarized banking history. Yeah, yeah, and in yeah. 20 years, banks gave people, get, banks gave bank accounts to only 1.5 million people in the country. Right. Yeah. So so the government with Bitcoin and with a national wallet was able to double that in a month. Yeah. Right. Right. Bitcoin allowed El Salvador to do in a month double what they had achieved in 20 years, 20 years. with a with a dollarized banking system. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. So here. So so here's the second point you have. So that, that was the perspective of a country that has huge remittances as a percentage of GDP, right? Which can be the case of Tonga, for example, which is the main country in the world with the highest percentage of personal remittances as a percentage of GDP. It's Tonga, without a doubt. Uh, okay, so the problem in a region like Latin America is that we've since the 1400s, being providing commodities to the rest of the world. Gold, coffee, cocoa, <laughs> whatever you call Whatever commodity. Pick, yeah. pick the one that you want to pick. Right, yeah, right? a, lot, a like, lot of, lot of uh, vegetables come from Latin America anyway. <laughs> you know, which, whichever, whichever, right? Yeah. But essentially, if you are a Venezuelan... If you sell bananas in Venezuela, you cultivate bananas or corn or beef or whatever, mm -hmm. and you want to sell that to an Argentinian, mm -hmm. right? Or to a Colombian that's next to Venezuela, or you're Brazilian, right? A Brazilian merchant, and you want to sell to an Argentinian consumer. Yeah. Right? How do you get paid? <laughs> How do you get paid? Dollar. <laughs> there's there's no there's no way they're gonna travel to your country yeah, yeah. to to residence themselves in your country, get a national ID, and then open up a bank account just to make you a payment. Yeah, that's not gonna happen, right? Never. Yeah. So, so 
Latin America, you have Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, Peru, Venezuela, Brazil, Costa Rica, and everybody has its own currency, right? Yeah. Except, except for the dollarized economies, yeah. right? Panama, Ecuador, El Salvador, Salvador yeah. right? Okay, nice. Latin America needs a new monetary standard right mm -hmm. to continue growing through its next growth economic growth process right yeah the next boom in latin america will be about interconnecting the region financially so that people can carry trades within the region with a single unit of account yeah that makes it easier to understand right what's the price of things etc Now, I understand, I understand from lots of economy, uh, economists, uh, renowned economists from UTAM, right? Venezuelans, Argentinians, Ecuadorians, Panamanians. Latin America will, through many countries, first go through a dollarization process before it goes through a hyper Bitcoinization process. Yeah. Look at Venezuela. Venezuela had to go through a process through which the Bolivar was completely wiped away. It's still there. So it teaches us that fiat is a hard bitch to kill. Uh, but, but what people use nowadays in Venezuela, more, more than 90% of trades are done with, with dollar in, almost in cash. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. so it's, So and I guess that in some cases, we will see a hyper-dollarization process, which is pretty much in theory, in, in, in line, which with Michael Saylor's theory, right, that the, the, fur, the world will first go through this hyper-dollarization process to financialize itself. And then with that infrastructure already financialized, hyper-financialized, right, with mm -hmm. access to the global economy, then it will start making people go down the, the Bitcoin oh, path. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? Down the Bitcoin the, rabbit hole. The more, so, the more US dollars printed money, it's going to exact, create, accelerate exactly. the, the Bitcoin adoption. Yeah. Exactly. So I guess, in, look, look, in a huge market like, like Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. It's an economy as big as Canada's. You, you can't expect that to happen over the short term, at least, because the, I mean, if you're a Brazilian worker, the only legal form of payment that you can receive is the Brazilian real, yeah. right? It's the local currency. Like, you cannot be paid in dollars in the case of Brazil, yeah. right? You cannot be paid in euros. You can't do contracts in a foreign currency other than their Brazilian real. Yeah. But they're now evaluating to allow workers in Brazil to be paid in Bitcoin. So again, because nobody, no state has to ask for permission of another state to use that currency, right? To use Bitcoin, it's ultimately going to be the easiest and fastest currency to be adopted as a, as a standard for the region, at least. And when I say the region like Latin America. It's not that I'm, I'm trying to constrain Bitcoin's adoption into only Latam there. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's yeah, just it's speaking everything, from my everything, perspective yeah. and my experience, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, but, but there you go. So, so like Venezuela would have been the perfect example, right? To, mm -hmm. to evaluate making Bitcoin legal tender, right? Like, So many people in the industry have already told me this, like, Alessandro, what the hell happened? It was supposed to be Venezuela. And I was like, dude, uh, communism and socialism, <laughs> right? Like, right? Because, because uh, at a socialist level, right? You run, you, you run the social, social campaigns, right? This government sponsored campaigns where you, whereby you give, free stuff to people and you you give people money but ultimately it's all financed by the fiat apparatus right mm -hmm. that the government's owned by the central banks so so i guess that 
if you look at economic history in, in Latin America, again, it's full of volatility, booms and bust periods, pretty much connected to commodities, a banking infrastructure that has been lacking innovation, right? And that has been over-regulated by governments for the past century. And it has mainly been tied to the boom of commodities and global markets. So I think that the next wave of innovation, of empowerment and economic, economic and social development for the region is, will, will mainly be achieved through Bitcoin thanks to us owning a, uh, a way to do commerce between ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. With the... Uh, um, with an accessible way without having to travel globally and access a global, a foreign bank account, so to speak, right? Yeah. Because ultimately, if, if you constrain things to the physical world, there's just so many, there's just so few people that are going to be able to access the, the financial means to be part of the global and digital economy, right? Yeah. And so to close, I guess that to close the loop and close this answer, Dara, um, to, to your last question is, um, look, Latin America's first unicorn company is Mercado Libre, right? So Mercado, Mercado, Libre, yeah. Mercado Libre, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Amazon, the Amazon of Latin, Latin America, America, right? Is this works as the source of truth for when you want to know the price of something in any specific market, right? Mm -hmm. So like you want to know the price of an iPhone in Brazil and you live in Latin America or you live wherever you may live in the world. What is it that you do? You go on Google, you go on Mercado Libre, you go into Mercado Libre, you go into the, the marketplace of the country where you want to investigate the price, right? Discover the price of a, of, x or y product and then you just you just type it in mercado libre search bar and that's it and ultimately mercado libre is now working as again as the source of truth for knowing and discovering prices to to carry out trade with yeah. someone else in the in the in the region right it's mercado libre without a doubt so what is it that we're missing again we are missing a common a common currency for us to do trade yeah. because the the banking system is completely completely disconnected yeah so that's why you see in the region a lot of startups from the fintech world yeah. trying to you know build on ramps from one country and off ramps into another country and and that's why you see a lot of foreign investment from usdcs and euvcs into these kind of companies because ultimately if, if the biggest marketplace in Latin America is already digital, right? And it's a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace of goods and services, Mercado Libre. What's going to continue happening is just, again, the booming use case of peer-to-peer -peer trades, right? In, in Latin America. So I think that the future, the future of Latin America, thanks to, thanks to Bitcoin, is going to finally be able for people and talent, talented people from the region to be able to sell their goods and services and whatever their knowledge as well, right? Yeah. Finally, gl globally. Because if, you, if you're from Latin America from an emerging market and you, what else do you use? If you don't have a US bank account and you need to receive a, 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 a payment from abroad, you use PayPal, right? Or yeah. Venmo. And then you get ripped off 10%, 17%, right? Yeah. Just to, right? Yeah. Just to change back into your local currency to buy food for your family, right? Or make yeah. a living, right? So, yeah. Wow. Wow. My <laughs> mind is like blown. <laughs> no, look, I, honestly, I, 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 I'm sorry, Dad, that sometimes I just, I just get into the podium. But whenever you ask El Sultan about... Latin America, America. <laughs> and that's that's it it's like it's never ending no but, but I really like it because you know uh, what I what I 
what ca- what I can summarize from this whole conversation is that, yeah, maybe economy can go bust. Like it can, it's beyond our control. Uh, but what we need to look for is opportunity, and what we need to look for is, yeah, like a, an alternative, right? And and it's good that there is Bitcoin. So for any other countries, even like in Indonesia, I mean, we, we, we had the same kind of problems back in the 60s, in 1998. Right now, in the Indonesia, inflation was still kind of good, like 1, 1.2% or something like that. But, you know, the, with the amount of the money that's printed and how much we are dependent on the dollars as well, it's just, it's, you know, it's just like a ripple effect. So, yeah, I really like how, how, how you and then other Latin American people really see the opportunity and then, you know, people will always find their way to store their wealth. So there's nothing that government can do about it. <laughs> Look, in, in the end, what, what I was taught by this, um, by this personal, ex- personal experience there of, of seeing my, my country's, my country's economy and currency go to, go to hell, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, was that if if money is a construct of the government, it is prone to being overused by 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 the government itself itself for its own for its own matter, whatever, right? Yeah. People, people didn't really believe that the government was going to take it this far, right? Yeah. So what I mean by this is like, I have so many memories of people in the country saying, oh yeah, well, the dollar is already at a hundred dollars, a hundred billion is against the dollar. How worse can it get, right? Right now it's at like 45 trillion. <laughs> 45 trillion. So, so, so what I mean by this is like the process, right? That interesting long-term process of people losing faith in their currency, mm-hmm. right? Is ultimately preceded by people losing faith in the government first. Yeah. And the moment that happens, right, I would say like at a really broad level in the economy, whichever economy it may be, the currency experiences, that country's currency experiences this brutal shocks, right, of 50% drops and 30% drops overnight. Now, I understand the dollar is the last domino of the piece, right, of the stack to fall, right? Mm-hmm. But, but in the case of, of this market where there's no global usage, right, for their currencies, right? Like the Venezuelan Bolivar, the Colombian Peso, the Argentinian Peso, the Brazilian Real, like those currencies are only used in those Country. economies. Yeah rise in those countries so so if i mean if you if you force people into using it but then ultimately it loses its fundamental value because it's 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 based on trust right mm-hmm. it's based on trust it gets into this chaotic point into which it accelerates the depreciation right, of, yeah. of the underlying currency. And so that's what we're seeing in the Turkish lira happen, right? Like, yeah. look, at, look at how many time it took for the Turkish lira to break the tenfold level, right? The yeah. 10 Turkish lira to the dollar level, right? But once it broke past that, boom, 16 and 20 and 50 and 100 is coming. And and I saw the same thing happening in Argentina, right? Like I went in 2013 Mm. to Argentina last time and it was like 10 10 pesos against a dollar. And right now it's like 250. 
yeah yeah so wow. so 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 what this what this teaches you right mm-hmm. what 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 government induced inflation and depreciation and destruction of a of a currency teaches you is that everything everything even in the money world is a survivor a sur- a survival of the fittest right and ultimately of the hardest mm-hmm. and so you you start you start at a at a personal and psycho and psychological level ask yourself what is what is the hardest thing that you could own mm-hmm. what is right like what is what is this one thing what is this one thing that i am missing that i need so that i can quit so that i can quit spending most of my time just taking care right of protecting my savings mm-hmm. because ultimately that's the point when you will be able to once again be be back to the point where you think long term where you where you think about educating yourself right where you think about right when you think about building a family mm-hmm. right yeah because otherwise you're just you're just in this horrible vicious cycle induced by governments yeah right which is so difficult to get outside of right it took me it took me personally more than five hard years in bitcoin to really you know recover what me and my family had lost wow. from a government induced effect yeah 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 right so i guess that mainly that's why i'm bullish on bitcoin i'm bullish on bitcoin because i see the empowerment that it can continue having for me and my family right mm-hmm. and i see the same thing happening for many other families globally yeah and eventually this not eventually i mean the snowball is already so big that nobody can stop it nobody can stop it nobody yeah. no nobody can fucking come in and press the red button here right yeah yeah so look um there yeah, this is uh this is why we bitcoin right mm-hmm. like i'm in we brazil see the future. yeah yeah we see <laughs> I'm, i'm in brazil i i come from venezuela you are in indonesia we met over bitcoin twitter <laughs> in the middle of a supposedly global hell right <laughs> and and we're just and we're just talking bitcoin and sharing our stories yeah. and sharing and sharing what the heck it is that we found out so far of this thing and so yeah. i think it's beautiful there's nothing freer than this and when you find it's beautiful that whenever we find bitcoin it's this thing that you can you can see mm-hmm. but that you live by yeah. right there's like a lot of commonalities of for sure like you know every countries that using fiat currency have, will have the same set of story different players same set of stories <laughs> but yeah well Thank you so much Alessandro. I think like this whole one hour more like it's it's been very eye opening. It's very fascinating as well to hear the story from Venezuela because you know if you go to if you go to the internet if you search YouTube it's always like so bleak like you know the with the whole hyperinflation story what happened. But I really like to see that there are like optimism uh, and there are like a lot of opportunity even during crisis even during the dark hours and 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 i really like that i really like that i and i really appreciate you know your time and your stories as well hopefully like we can chat more about this <laughs> in the future oh, oh for sure look yeah. the pl- the pleasure was all mine there and honestly <laughs> uh, honestly uh look i just um spreading the word is important right yeah the right the right word yeah and yeah, so yeah. there's not there's not that many you know um uh, well i would say there's 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 many actually untold stories right yeah of uh 
of of bitcoiners and people that are do, doing beautiful and amazing stuff out there right uh we just got to keep fighting and keep uh keep united because uh gladly we have we have a common thing right yeah for us to speak about and uh speak through as well yeah. so uh i appreciate your time and i appreciate your invitation and i pretty much much look forward to definitely staying in touch via via twitter and um and, yeah, how, and how, you know how people can can find you as well if people wants to you know learn more and then chat with you Yeah, for sure. So just, I guess that over all social media, whatever it may be, uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, I'm El Sultan Bitcoin. That's E-L Sultan Bitcoin. Yeah. And please follow at Hodo with Ledin. Mm-hmm. Ledin is the first Canadian lending company. Uh, we essentially offer Bitcoin back loans. We just launched the world's first Bitcoin mortgage which hopefully we will speak more about in another episode there. Yeah. And um, please uh, just follow me if you want to keep learning Bitcoin Venezuela. And if you just want to have a chat about how Bitcoin is being fashioned around in Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of your audience as well, Dea. Yeah. This thank was you. lovely. <laughs> thank I'll you. Thank you very much. Soon. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the My Bitcoin Story. Stay tuned for more episodes and click that follow button.